I need the wisdom so I can bring all of this out into the world. It's like, again, you're, you're, you're in the ego. We focus on the how. We focus on how can I live this experience, go through all these stages and cycle through and, and uh, remove suffering and just be with what is. Be with what is and be okay with it. And not have to say that we're, um, oh my gosh, I've backtracked, right? People think if you've gotten to wisdom and then you find yourself again in like in a new awakening, you're like, oh my gosh, or, or ignorance. Oh, I've backtracked. I've gone back. I've backslided. It's like, no, you haven't. You're constantly on the path. You're always on the path. You're always on the path. You're always progressing through. Not forward, not backward. You're always progressing through. And this is so important to remember. Welcome to Ignite the Spark Within, a podcast designed to do just that, ignite your spark within you. I'm your host, Sarah Malone, owner of Spark Fitness and Lifestyle Coaching and voted Yahoo Finance's top 10 female coaches to follow in 2021. I believe everyone has a fire inside them, a powerful purpose, a story waiting to be told, and everyone can uncover and unleash this power. Every day you have the choice to either let your experiences shape you or take control and use your experiences to shape the world around you. You were made to experience happiness, freedom, joy, purpose, love, passion, and abundance. Disrupt the status quo, think for yourself, and join forces with those around you doing the same. Join me for thought-provoking conversations along with the strategies needed in order to help you ignite your spark within. Welcome back to the show, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you. I love this channel so much, um, mainly because I get to talk unscripted, semi-scripted for as long as I want to, kind of. Um, I've been back on social media, um, getting my game back on, and I find it so challenging to bring value and a, a, a very pivotal point in 90 seconds or less, right? And what I found is that um, what it does to most people's mindset and their brain, the way that they think, right? We start to think, we start to follow the patterns of which um, reward us in certain areas, right? And social media is a way that I really see this in action. We get rewarded for having something real catchy in 90 seconds or um, making something very visually appealing and catching somebody's eye or catching their attention for at least whatever, you know, 90 seconds or less. And I find that to be kind of damaging to the creative process, at least mine. And so, and this podcast and this channel, um, and I'm going somewhere with this, so bear with me, has been such a blessing for me to be able to be re to stay ignited, I should say, in my passions, in um, bringing value, in teaching, in learning, in growing, um, because it can be kind of discouraging when you see people just like the candy hits on social media. And um, and so with that being said, I would like to start this podcast the way that I start every show, and that is with deep, deep gratitude. So much gratitude for you guys continuing continually listening. Um, Y'all know who you are, my regular listeners, listeners out there. Um, you know, text me, email me, um, and also comment on the show on YouTube um, quite frequently. And that keeps me alive. And it also inspires me because of the questions or segues it ignites or sparks in you guys. And so I would just like to thank you, start the show by thanking you for listening. And of course, I would like to ask you if this show brings you value and specifically this episode, because this is going to be a very, very timely and good one for this time that we're experiencing right now. Um, if it brings you value, please share it, share, 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 share it with five people right now, go. And if it does bring you value, again, please rate it if you haven't already um, on Spotify or wherever you're listening. It just helps other listeners become aware of the show and helps um, kind of uh, portray a level of authority to this show. A um, couple of announcements before we begin the show. Um, number one, our next retreat is February 1st through 5th. Now here's the deal. This is a four day growth and healing retreat. It's also extremely fun and the, probably the most alive you'll feel in a very long time. We are hosting 10 participants this time and we're already half filled. 
The reason I'm hosting 10 is because we have a lot more hands on deck now. Um, with gratitude, you know, my, my significant other is going to be assisting um, at this retreat. My co-facilitator, Kelly, will be there. And we have a few volunteers now starting to come back from previous retreats and graduates who were so ignited that they have found a way to implement their gifts and just want to be a part of this with us. So we're hosting 10 people. We're already half filled, you guys. Um, and so if this is of interest to you, again, this is probably the most transformational thing I've ever been a part of myself. And, and that's saying a lot because I've been a part of other retreats or seminars or workshops with other people, big names, Tony Robbins even. And um, and I've never seen something like this, what happens at the reignition retreats. And I don't say that to brag or to say, um, look at what I've created. I'm very proud of what's been created through me, um, but it's not mine, right? It's something that I'm very proud of having given up to God and allowing him to form it and mold it and craft it the way that he sees fit. And that's exactly what has happened. And um, I can't, you know, I can't even imagine or couldn't have even dreamed of some of the things that, that come through and happen at these experiences and these retreats. People's lives are being changed because of it. And um, I'm just happy to be a vessel. So I'm just going to be very transparent. The retreat is four days, uh, three full days, four nights. We'll be in Sedona at the Transformation House. Um, that's where uh, I will be hosting all of my retreats going forward. It's a beautiful, beautiful spot right in the Red Rocks. All meals are included. All your lodging is included. You'll be shuttled to and from the airports. The only thing that's not included is your flight. The cost of the entire retreat is $1,770. $1,770. There's a $500 um, deposit to reserve your spot. So if you are interested and if you're feeling called, text me. Um, email me, message me on social media, or you can straight up go right to the website, sparkflc.com and put in your deposit right there. And I will be in touch with you within the next 24 hours with all of the details. Um, this is something that we are very passionate about um, bringing to the masses and um, training facilitators to be able to facil facilitate more of these retreat experiences because the program is so powerful. Um, and then of course, you know, a just little blurb, we've got the online courses online still, um, that's a mind, body, and spirit course. You can either buy them in a bundle and get, you know, your whole vessel taken care of, uh, or just focus on one pillar at a time, mind, body, and spirit. It is a very, um, structured way to, um, from point A to point B, as far as your, um, mental, emotional, and spiritual, and then physical health is concerned. Now, let's dive in. Today's episode is titled The Path to and Through Awakening. Um, I titled it that earlier. Um, and I would like to reframe that and say, you know, the experience of awakening. Now, uh, what we will discuss in this episode has to do with awakening, enlightenment, and you can also reframe this at a very layman's terms of simply growth, healing, and life. Um, now, it's important to note that I have identified seven stages in this process. We'll go through each one of them more at a logistical um, perspective first. Um, then we'll also go through it as far as the emotional experience of each stage. We will also go through the fact that not everybody experiences every one of these stages and um, they are not in any particular order. Sometimes they will go out of order, but in a very linear fashion, we'll go from step uh, stage one to stage seven. It's also important to note that these stages are not distinct points. If we're looking at them on a timeline or a graph, they're not distinct points. It's more of a... Um, a very abstract kind of
more of a spectrum than it is um, a line, like a point A to point B, or, or even um, in some people's terms, they 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 view this as a ladder, one being above the other one, or we're going up, we're stepping up, and we're up a level, and it's like we're leveling up. And so I'd like to I'd like us to first of all, as we're going into this process, um, distinguish the fact that these stages operate on a spectrum, and the spectrum doesn't go from left to right, doesn't go from up to down. It goes all over, right? And that's actually um, as far as raising our consciousness, raising our quote unquote vibration, raising our frequency. It's the same here, right? I think that. Off in terms, and we'll talk about this. This is actually one of the stages of enlightenment or of awakening. Um, is that we think that as we are growing or um changing, I will reframe it and say changing our vibration, we think that we are going up a ladder, meaning that we are better than we were before, or we're better than someone else. And so I'd like to begin by just um, asking you to open your mind a bit and understand that there is no better or worse. There is no important, more important than another. There's no more important place than the next. There's no more important person than another, even if they have what we perceive to be, uh, have achieved the stage of wisdom, which is the seventh stage. And so um, it's also important to note that there are very distinct stages along these seven stages that uh, solitude or seclusion or alone time or loneliness may actually be an appropriate path or an appropriate outlet. Uh, and so it's important to note that along these ways, there are going to be uh, required of us or asked or called of us different approaches or different states or different environments. Um, and so we'll talk about that too. I would also like to note that for me personally, how I view these stages and this kind of pendulum experience, right, that we're experiencing, like if you picture a pendulum, and this is why I say it, it operates on a spectrum. If we can picture a pendulum for a moment, the pendulum never stops. It's constantly in, mo in motion, meaning we are, so then we are very fluidly flowing um, kind of in and out of or along these stages. And I hope this makes sense. Now, there are certain stages that for me um, highlight a, a greater opportunity for uh, aliveness, like a sense of aliveness or an excitement or a vibrance or a vigor for life. So there are certain stages here that kind of bring more of a, I am really uh, living this human experience type of feeling. And I would like to point those out too. I, um, I also have, you know, the ego part of me has um, kind of my favorites um, as far as um, these, these uh, stages of awakening. And I'll point those out too, just as a fun little note. Um, and so Without further ado, let's dive in. This episode is completely just based on these seven stages. Now, there's a purpose for me bringing this to light because I've recently just experienced the last two, um, uh, and we'll go through that in a moment. But for me, coming full circle to that, and then there was an episode that I had just done with a man named Scott Feinberg um, a few weeks back. Actually, that was the last podcast that was recorded. Um, if you want to go back and listen to that, but... You know, he said something to me that I needed to hear at that specific and very distinct time because I was kind of hovering and struggling to, to move myself through the sixth stage, which is humility. Um, and I'll go through all seven in just a moment. But I, you know, having this puzzle kind of completed for me as, as far as my own individual path of experience, not um, knowledge, right? Because I think wisdom and knowledge is two very different things. Not I think it is. Knowledge and wisdom are very different things. And we can go into that um, at another time. But um, the importance of this is because there are a lot of people on this path of quote unquote awakening right now, right? And um it's funny because uh, it seems as though people think that they have just 
started their awakening. But the, the truth is that the whole thing, the whole, all of life is one big awakening, right? We are always on the path. We are always in the process and we are always moving through stages. It's just that we don't realize it. And so, and actually this is part of the stages. So um, on this path and this experience, here are the seven stages of awakening or enlightenment or consciousness okay and, and if I, I have my note takers out there i know there are some out there um you can pause it if you need to as i'm going through these seven but we're going to list all seven that i'm going to dissect each one so just hang with me here so the first stage is purity the second stage is injury the third stage is ignorance The fourth stage is awareness. The fifth stage is arrogance. The sixth stage is humility. And the seventh stage is wisdom. So purity, injury, ignorance, awareness, arrogance, humility, and wisdom. These are the seven stages that we will be going through today now let me just say that aside from all the semantics of awakening enlightenment consciousness raising our vibration um this is really just the human experience right this is the human experience as it was intended to be um by god because there is a a lot of hmm throughout these stages there is so much growth and there's learning and there's um embodiment you know and and i we can probably couple embodiment with wisdom um that would be kind of like the eighth and final stage when we reach the stage of embodiment right that's a that's a state of a uh, being it's a state of i amness um rather than any sort of separateness Right. And so this is this is really just the human experience of growth is what we're referring to here. And and ultimately, when we can get to a point where there's no agenda in this process, meaning we uh, we realize that all steps are important, all stages are important. Um, there's a very specific purpose to each stage, and we will most likely recycle these stages um, multiple times throughout our lifetime we begin to drop into the present which is another term of embodiment and and the acknowledgement of where we are helps us to really experience it fully right i think when we're trying to move when we're trying cuz trying is lying remember all my all my clients know this saying by now trying is lying um, but when we are trying to move from one stage to the next because we're very unhappy or unsettled or there's a discontent or dis-ease or it's just very uncomfortable for us to be at a specific stage, we then try to expedite the process of moving out of that one and into the quote-unquote next one, whichever that one may be. And most of the time we are hoping to move ourselves out of the experience so that we don't have to feel what that stage um what that stage's feelings um include and so but the problems occur when we try to do this it ends up we either um backtrack or hold ourselves hostage for far too long the uh the secret to moving through these stages in a much more fluid state and i don't even want to say fast because it's very important that time for us is different than what it is in the heart right that the heart knows no timeline it knows no time it only knows um healing and the process of this this very cyclical um circular process and so i say that to say um we can much more fluidly move through these stages when we let go of trying to get out of the current one that we're in and moving to a different one meaning if we're in the stage of injury we've just been harmed uh it could be a very common trip up to want to run from it um or stay in the injury or 
um, deny the injury or try to try to heal, right? You can't, how do you try to heal, right? You, by trying to heal is the, is an oxymoron because healing doesn't happen in a trying state. Trying is forcefulness and healing can only happen with the letting go type of, type of, uh, approach. Okay. Letting go and letting go and surrendering can feel very close to, depending on your state of the heart to, uh, giving up. Uh, but it's not. It's just letting go of the of the process. Also, the harm. Right. It's important to to have uh, knowledge around the harm that's been done. But here's what happens. Right. There's two things that happens. Number one, trouble or problems occur for us when we either stay in one of these stages for too long. And we could do this for many reasons um or we try to move too quickly through the process it's like um those types of people are those kind of growth addicts right they're constantly seeking growth it's like they're almost a, in a state of confusion at which stage that they're in because they're not able to recognize where they are and just be in that stage they have to constantly be doing something or feel like they're they're working on something. And some of these stages just require presence and appreciation and gratitude and um, even uh, just an introversion or introspection or whatever that may be. Um, and so it's important that we allow ourselves to move fluidly through these stages. And we do that by simply becoming aware and recognizing where we are. And then settling into and dropping into that place and asking this question of what's here for me, right? What's here for me? If you're in a state of uh, humility that doesn't feel so nice, um, instead of trying to, and, and, and I will explain why humility doesn't feel so nice in a moment, or let's just say injury, right? Or ignorance, Instead of saying, I've got to, I've got to get out of this place. Uh, I just got to grow. I just got to do this. I just got to do that. I just got to heal. Instead, we should, we should pause. We should be where we are because it's okay to be where we are. In fact, we know that it's okay to be where you are because you are there and asking yourself the question of what is here for me? What is here for me? What am I supposed to learn here? And, and also adding on to that is, the desire not to move out of that place until you've grasped what you're supposed to in that place. Okay. It's making sense. So before we even begin to dive into that, I just wanted to make that very clear is that this is a, a pendulum. We are moving through it. And if we really want to remove the distress or the feeling of restriction or the feeling of uh, suffering from our life, um, more and more, right? Because here, here is the thing. The, the goal here is not wisdom. I mean, that is a nice goal. We all would like wisdom, right? But that's not everybody's goal. That's in fact, that's not everybody's path. That's not everybody's destiny. You see, the goal here is, oh my gosh, the goal here is to experience these stages and move through them because everybody does. The goal here is to be able to better move through these stages in the absence or lessening of suffering. Let me say that one more time. The goal here is not necessarily to get from, you know, ignorance over here to wisdom way over here and think that we're way high up here and that we are the most amazing thing that, that God created. You are amazing. That's absolutely no doubt about that. You are very amazing. And wisdom is a path that we should all seek, right? It's it's a pursuit that we should seek. It's not a destination. Okay, let me ref oh my gosh. Wisdom is a pursuit. It's not a destination. You can't just arrive at wisdom and say, I'm done, I've made it, I've accomplished my goal. Because what happens when you get there? Is there happiness staying there? And this is what I mean about problems occurring when we stay in one stage for too long, is that if I stay in the path of wisdom, like eventually I get very bored. It's very boring. There's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of pursuit with that. If I've arrived at wisdom, what, then what more do I need to seek? 
Okay. The seeking phase is what brings us this sense of aliveness to life, right? It's the spark of life. And so it's important not to have an agenda here, but the goal then is to, is a little bit more elusive. Instead of saying the goal is to get to here, it's more so to say the goal is to experience it this way. Oh my gosh. The goal is not to get here. The goal is to experience this, this path in this way. This way meaning um, an absence of suffering. Pain, yes. Suffering, no. We choose suffering. Pain may happen, but we choose suffering. And so the goal here is to uh, more so become uh, the, hmm, the person who becomes a part of the how, not necessarily the what. Okay. So we then say, I, I am an active participant in this life journey where I'm inevitably going on these stages through these stages. And I choose to participate in the way, not of trying to control my what or my direction or my speed or my destination of getting to wherever you think you're going, because we're all going to the same place. We're all walking each other home. We're all walking each other home in some way, shape, or form. And we're also all going to the same place. So I don't know where you think you're going, but the goal here is to become the participant in how you experience this process. Meaning, if I'm going through um, if a stage of injury, and this may be perceived as bad, I can choose not to suffer here. Okay, this is the goal we should be aiming for. I choose not to suffer here. I choose to experience this fully because this is part of the human experience. But I'm also going to bring in the divine part of myself into this quote unquote pain. I'm going to allow myself to be human to feel the pain. I'm going to bring in now the divine part of me and the divine, the divine period, meaning God, bringing in God to allow myself to experience this fully without suffering. Does this make sense? So the goal here has to do more with the how than the where or the what. Okay, this is very important to remember because this will allow us, the reason that this podcast is so important is because this path to awakening is out, is, is kind of shattering some beliefs about what enlightenment is, what it should feel like, what it should look like. Um, and um, I made a quote the other day and it was, you know, the moment we stop seeking enlightenment and start seeking the human experience is the moment that we find enlightenment because it's here where we bridge and we merge the human with the divine, the, the, the divine that is in all of us. And this is the process of doing this. And so I'm going to highlight these different stages. We're going to dissect them a little bit, break them down provide some emotional examples. And then we're going to see how by merging all of this together, we get to really, really experience ascension. Ascension in the way of not um, transcending your experience, right? There's a difference between transcending and ascending. Transcending means you're getting taken out of something. Um, and ascending just means that you're staying in that but you are rising up in it. Oh my gosh. Let's let's break that down one more time. The difference between transcending and ascending is transcending removes us from a situation and puts us somewhere else that we think is greater. Ascending means that we stay in that situation, but we get raised in it. All right. So this um this pendulum let's let's flip the pendulum upside down and instead picture it almost like a mountain okay the mountain has a peak um and so we're going to climb the mountain there are certain stages of ascension ascending the mountain and then there are phases of descending the mountain 
Okay. And um, Maslow once said that in self-actualization, we are seeking kind of like these peak moments, these peak memories. And in psychology and in therapy language, we call these glimmers, little glimmers. Glimmers are really just kind of like peak moments that we highlight throughout our life that are really meaningful and exciting and um, and they stick with us. And those are awesome to have, right? But, um, excuse me, but um, the peak moments are the more few and far between, right? If we're looking at um, this really wide uh, array of mountains, if you look across, there are certain distinct points where there are peaks, those points are so obviously um, disproportionately less than the points of valley or empty space or the void. Okay. Oh my gosh. So we have to remember these peak moment peak moments are few and far between, and the void spaces or the valleys are much more frequent. And so, number one, let's just acknowledge that as fact, as reality. And be okay with that, that we shouldn't be seeking to have peak moments all the time. In fact, Maslow later retracted that and he reframed it that we should be make, we should be focusing on plateau moments. Plateau not meaning complacency, not meaning like, oh, I plateaued, I'm not growing anymore, but making almost like raising the level, and this will make sense in just a moment, guys raising the level of um, the valleys to cl more closely match the peaks, meaning we'll have a higher foundation overall, meaning we will plateau higher. And what this really is saying is that we find the extraordinary in the mundane, right? Instead of seeking really high moments of of peak excitement and, and kind of like living based on those, because that can be very very um, disheveling to the human spirit. If we're constantly looking for those peak moments, knowing that they're few and far between, then what we experience is a very deep drop at the end of that, as far as mentally, the disappointment, emotionally, the disappointment. Um, needing those peak moments um, creates and sets us up for a little bit of a disaster when the moment is over. And so what Maslow was really referring to once he changed this statement was saying that instead we should have a higher plateau, meaning we experience bliss um, or happiness or joy or fulfillment um, in the everyday, finding the extraordinary in the mundane, finding the excitement in the mundane. Um, and so this is what we are seeking here with these stages. So let's climb the mountain. We're going to do this first with the state of purity. Now, uh, purity is pretty much the very base of the mountain. It's like you haven't even started climbing yet, right? Purity is you come into this world, you're pure. There's really nothing filthy on you yet um, because the world hasn't had a chance to get a hold of you yet. And uh, that purity piece um, is also in the soul phase of your existence, meaning you're in the ether and, um, you know, your soul doesn't have a body at that time, however long that may be. Um, and so the spark of life that is you is really the pure part of you, this pureness, this purity. And, um, it's like, you don't know anything bad. You don't know anything negative. You don't know, that your ego has a way of getting a hold of you and working with you and you don't know good and evil and you're pure, right? You're like Adam and Eve, pure, base, very clean, um, faultless, no scratches, no bruises. Now, this, this stage can be very short-lived um, and you may find um, as you're mm, mm -hmm, progressing through these stages, the wisdom piece will provide um, this almost purity feeling or sense or awareness again, because when you reach the point of true wisdom, you understand that that pure piece of you, the soul piece of you is still in there and it's still pure and it's still intact. This is something that we work with in IFS, internal family systems, is that this self, the I, I call your heart the seat of the soul. So this um this seat of the soul that resides inside your heart 
It's this pure, undamageable part of you. And, and it's pure. Okay. This is, this is the first stage. It's very simple. It's purity, 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 unscathed, unwounded, undamaged, um, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of ignorant in a way, because it's like, I don't know what could possibly harm me. Right. And then we move, um, into this stage of injury when it's like, we go from purity to like, I'm getting hurt. And it's like, how I'm blindsided. Right. When we're children and things start to happen, there's this level of like confusion to, I don't understand how this could, um, happen? How can I be hurt this way? How come mom responded that way? How come, you know, we're confused? It's injury, it's wounding. And on this, this stage, you can see how, um, you know, can be um, those initial stages of life when the traumas are quote unquote happening. But I mean, thinking about this in terms of life, we go through life and many injuries happen, right? Many injuries happen that um, sometimes we're not even aware of, okay? This is the stage where um, things are happening to us that are creating parts of us. We talk about this in IFS too, creating parts of it called the ego, call it ego parts um, or just call it parts, but they're creating parts of us that, um, that now are beginning to form as protection to the self, the pure self inside of us still okay following so stage one is purity totally untouched unscathed unwounded nothing bad can ever happen injury now bad things are happening and i'm like what right there's a huge shock to the system injury is injury is where ego has a chance to be created it doesn't have a chance yet to kind of do damage to you but it's like things are happening, injuries are happening, pains are happening, traumas are happening, and things are being created within us um, in order to protect the purity, again, in order to protect the purity. Um, and we experience the pain of the human experience. But the pain isn't in there. So we keep ascending, right? We are ascending this mountain. We're kind of not at the base of the mountain. We enter into stage three, which is ignorance. And ignorance is a very, very interesting stage because um, some people, so some people um, only get to this stage, right? They just kind of stop here. A lot of people actually. Um, and ignorance is this stage where we are kind of unaware of our own ego. We have these shadow sides. We have, um, you know, the dark sides of us, the personality that has been created from the injury, the uh, the ego states again. Um, we have so many shadows that we really can't see them. We're kind of just we're just really ignorant, right, to um, what has happened to us. Um, we kind of are convinced at this stage that like who we are. This is the limit, right? This is. But the, this perception of ourselves that has been created by conditioning, and we kind of forget, we forget who we are. This is the forgetting stage. This is the forgetting of who we are. We think we know who we are, um, but what we think we know is basically just the conglomeration of different parts of us in ego that have been created from the injury, right? And we begin to identify with these parts with these injured parts. This is this is why I say it's very ignorant because we we have an ignorance the 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 whole term ignorance implies that we don't even know that we're ignorant. We don't know that we don't know. We think we know. That's a little bit arrogant too, but we'll get to that one. But we don't even know that we don't know. Okay? This is the part where a lot of people just stop and accept that this is the way that they are. This is how they were supposed to be. This is what life is. And they almost accept this very low state of being, this very inaccurate uh, depiction and description of themselves, meaning they have forgotten now who they are. Okay. 
So this is the forgetting. This is where the average person um, may, they may even cycle through therapy with this, you know, thinking like, I just have to almost deal with this um, suffering that I consistently find myself in. And I, I, I don't find that there's a solution out of it. I just find a way to manage it. Okay. This is, this is the managing stages where people think that they just need to manage their condition. This is the trouble with diagnoses. This is why I don't like diagnoses because diagnoses says, this is who you are. And here's a way to manage it rather than this is not who you are. This is a way that you've, um, this is a way that you've conditioned yourself to be. Um, but here's a path through that, right? Like how many people just get diagnosed with bipolar or depression or ADD and then assign themselves that identity? Like I have ADD. Oh, that may bring a little alleviation at the time. Like um, at least I know what's wrong with me, but it brings no further action than to continue to learn how to use that. If, if, if indeed you do have a chemical deficiency in your brain that 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 um, prevents you from being able to focus, then instead of medicating that, we can say, how do I use this in a way that's actually productive in my life and I can still have peace in the process, right? That's why diagnoses are scary and that's why ignorance is scary because then we just we just be, take the lazy route of saying, ah, yes, mm -hmm, this is what's wrong with me. No wonder. No wonder I have all this stress, even though even after the, after the diagnosis, we still have all of that stress. We just now have a label to call ourselves along with that stress. And so this is a very dangerous part to stay, right? Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is pain and it is big time pain the longer we stay in it, right? The longer we stay in an ignorant place, think about a relationship, right? It's like, if I go into a really bad, destructive, painful, uh, abusive relationship, and I learn quickly that it's going to be abusive, painful, and destructive, then I can make a choice and I can get out. I just saved myself a lot of time, a lot of effort, and a lot of other probably pains and woundings along that path. But if I choose to stay ignorant in that relationship for a long period of time, this leads to many more pains along the way that I'll have to heal from later or not. Some people never even choose to go back and heal from that, right? They just either stay there because it's too much trouble to remove themselves and then have to go back and dissect all of that because that's a healing process. Um, or they just stay in their wounding um, for too long and uh and choose to turn that blind eye I, I can't tell you how many people i see do that all right it's what prevents us from taking truly truly taking measures and actions and making decisions and attending retreats and signing up for a course and hiring a therapist or you name it it's what it's what um what prevents us from taking those actions because we refuse to look at what's really happening inside of us this is the ignorant stage okay and uh this is stage 3 now here's where it gets fun right here's where um a lot of people have found themselves recently in the past 2 to 3 3 years um and this happens in stages collectively as well. This is what's so cool, right? This These stages don't just happen on a personal level. They also happen on a collective level. But we're just taking the personal level for right now. Because um, it's very big to think of this happening in a collective level. And I can tell you exactly where we are in the collective level once we're finished. The next stage is awakening or awareness. This is a stage that, um, as I said, mentioned earlier, how I have a few favorites. This is one of my favorites. And the reason this is one of my favorites is because this is a seeking phase. It is a phase where we are curious, we are open, we are craving learning what is more, right? We're craving learning this, the truth about ourselves, about the world, about God. This is the awakening phase where we are really like, our vision goes from like only wanting to see this small sliver within ourselves and, and not wanting to see anything else because it might be too much for us to handle to us taking off the blinders and being like, oh, what else is there, right? This is a big time ascension. Now, this is like the top part of the mountain right before you reach the peak. 
This is, we are learning who we are. We are beginning to remember again. We're beginning to, um, to learn that there's so much more to all of this than we thought originally, especially ourselves, right? We're beginning to now see the fact that, oh my gosh, this is actually my ego at work. These are my parts of my ego that are at work. And this is not truly who I am. Like there's, oh my gosh, there's this pure part of me and I'm a soul and I am divine. And I was made in the divine image of God. And we experience almost this profound understanding of the vast infinity of reality, right? And this can be troublesome for a reason because it's very overwhelming. It's very overwhelming to be up here, right? It's like picture yourself climbing a mountain and you get to this really high point right before the peak. And if someone's like, don't look down and you're like, huh, I'm going to do what you told me not to do because my brain didn't hear the don't. So I'm going to look down. I'm going to be like, holy, whoa, how is this possible, right? I see all of this now. And I also see it from a different perspective because I'm higher, in elevation, right? Okay. So I'm higher in elevation, not in superiority, not in importance, but I'm higher in elevation. I'm a different, I'm at a different perspective now on the mountain and I can see it all. And I can see your mountain over there and I can see so-and-so's mountain over there. And I can see that we are all going to climb these mountains and we're all going to the same place. And I'm divine. And also None of this matters. And like so much of it matters. And um, so there's this deep, deep portion of this process that is the awareness. And um, again, this can be a painful part of the process too, because sometimes bringing a light into a shadow is really hard when you expose something for the first time. Like when you become aware of the fact that you've been the cause of your own suffering and that you thought you were loving and you really weren't loving and that you you were trying to seek love from everybody else and you were the best relationship that you neglected or that you abandoned yourself or that you know you put so much time into a relationship that was never supposed to be for you um, long term, right? It was of course a part of your growing experience because that's the nature of all relationships is they're not wrong, they're a part of your growing experience. But you begin to see things right for what they are in this awareness phase instead of your rose colored glasses and what you wanted it to be or what the um instead of the rose color glasses, really you had on the ignorant glasses, which had a lot of blind spots. Okay. They had blind spots that you couldn't see the whole picture and you couldn't see things for what they really were. Now, as your awareness begins to open, and this could be a very long stage. So we, we better get used to hanging out here for a minute. Um, so as this awareness is expanding, right, we're seeing things for what they really are instead of what we wanted them to be. And that's going to be very different. It's going to be a clashing. Okay. There's going to be, and this is actually a point where, um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, solitude or seclusion may be an appropriate response here. Um, in fact, um, it may be the best response because in, in a way, not completely, not being reclusive, right? Not um, being a hermit. Some people say, oh, I'm just in a hermit mode. It's like, you shouldn't be in hermit mode. If you're in solitude to reflect, that's one thing. If you're in solitude because you're depressed, that's when you need to seek outside of yourself to have someone help you um, help you navigate those waters, right? I wouldn't go up to Mount Everest and be like, oh, this is like really hard. I feel like I'm going to die. Let me just like hole up here. I'd be like, I need a guide. Let me have somebody help me through these treacherous waters because this is not fun to look at. And actually, here's where I'll mention the dangers of psychedelics. I love psychedelics. I do not think that they're for everyone. I think that they're for a, for a very specific person at a very specific place in their path. And sometimes um, we are not ready to see the whole picture. That's why our ego protects us. That's why our conscious mind protects us. 
from seeing everything at once because it can be overwhelming and we may not have the capabilities or the resources to handle it, okay? Oh my gosh. Psychedelics have the ability to blast you off into the abyss and show you everything at once. And this is this can be an, a really great thing and it can be a really bad thing depending on the person, where they are, also their uh, maturity about life, right? And um, their path up to that point. It's like if you've done no healing work or you've refused to look at your shadows and do any sort of conscious work first and you think that psychedelics is the answer for you to heal, then you are, I'm sorry, but you may be severely wrong and be careful because this can do a lot of damage and cause you a lot of pain. Because if you don't have the um, attitude of, I want to see the truth, I want to see, oh. If you don't have the attitude of, I want to see the truth, I want to see my shadows, I want to see things for what it is, um, then going into a psychedelic experience is going to expose you to something that you didn't want to see in the first place, and thus a counter reaction may happen, meaning it could really um, backfire and be what we call in therapy, um, what we call in therapy, backlash. Okay, it's called backlash. So I love this stage of the process because number one, it brings the sense of aliveness. And I think whenever you're in the pursuit of something, a very active pursuit, which awakening and awareness is, it brings this sense of um, fire to the life that you're living, right? There's like a purpose to it. It's like, I'm seeking, I'm I'm on the hunt, right? It's, um, it's very innate in us to feel happy, or purposeful, or fulfilled, or alive when we are seeking something, when we are progressing towards something. And this is what this stage has the potential to bringing to bring to us. Um, the awakening piece is um, so there's like this stage is called like awakening slash awareness because it's like on a mental level, it's the awareness towards the parts that you'd had been you know, shoving in a corner and uh, refusing to look at and the awakening piece of in, as far as spirituality goes of realizing that there is so much infinite intelligence and realizing what that infin infinite intelligence is around you, realizing that it lives within you, realizing that you are made in the image of God, realizing that, um, you know, God has been literally guiding your path this entire time, realizing your soul's existence, the eternal nature to your being, realizing the eternal um, a God that is love and that love is really all there is, you know, um, and there's a lot to experience in this awakening stage, the, um, the awakening to the fact that everything has been important um and everything has been a part of your journey your, your your beautiful growing journey okay this is such a beautiful place to be because when we can be open and have that again that commitment that mindset of growth then um then we can really take this in and hold it and hold it and um and what happens though <laughs> is that realizing all of this, learning all of this. And it's like, we're being expanded so much. It's like mind blown, right? We continue to go up, up, up to the peak, which is not what you think. The peak here that I'm referring to is the next stage, which is arrogance. And the arrogance comes when we go through this awareness of the, this awakening, because part of awareness is also the healing process, right? We're healing the ego, uh, the parts of us that have been damaged from the injury. We're doing these things. We're learning a lot in that phase, right? We're learning so much that we get to a point where we think we know it all. Arrogance. We think we know it all. We think we're above others because we've reached this state of awakening and awareness and consciousness and we raised our vibration and um, all of these 
amazing things that we've done, which we really haven't done any of it, right? We've just learned and remembered. <laughs> That's the funny part is that um, we now think that we're kind of like above others because we know this truth. We know these facts. We know this knowledge. And um, we think that we are kind of like better than people who still reside in phases of say ignorance or even injury, like we can save them, right? It's a savior complex. The arrogance is really the savior complex of like, I'm a leader, I'm a savior, I saved, I changed your life, I did this, I died, I, 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 I. It's a lot of I phase, right? It's like, um, this is what happens too with some people who aren't ready for psychedelics is they all of a sudden think that they're Jesus. Now they think that they're Jesus reincarnated. And they get this misconception. And now we can also argue that that's spiritual warfare and that's just straight up evil. But we arrogantly posture ourselves in this stage above others. And sometimes this can turn people away from spirituality altogether, right? It's um, it's the uh, the pastor who speaks very convicted about all of the things that we should and shouldn't do. And meanwhile, he's doing all of those things and more. Right. It's the it's the uh, spiritual guru who just talks above everyone with this arrogant spirit. And now here's the thing. Some of these things, they may be saying accurate things. This is not the problem. The 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 problem is not that they're relaying inaccurate information sometimes. And this is the kicker, guys. This is the difference between a false prophet and a prophet is the state of the heart. So if I know these truths now and I'm relaying them from my arrogant spirit, meaning I'm on the peak of the mountain looking down at you, wherever you are, I'm up here looking down at you um, saying these truths. People know that they feel it, first of all, and it can turn them away. Number two is be careful. Remember, first pride, then the fall. So stay at the peak too long and you fall right off the mountain. Oh, my gosh. First pride, then the fall. Pride and arrogance go hand in hand. Arrogance says, I know it all. I'm better than. I'm up here looking down at you. I am teaching you. I'm saving you. I'm changing your life. Here, here, take my hand. And what happens is <laughs> taking all these hands and guess what happens? You get flipped right over the mountain. And so this is this stage is really, really important not to stay here too long. Um, although we'll all stay here as long as we need. Right, right. And again, this these stages can happen in a single day, right? I can go from the path of feeling really pure in the morning and then ouchy getting hurt and then being like, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then and then being like, oh, you know what? That was a part of me that just was created. Wow, I'm becoming aware of that. And then being arrogant again in the process of being like, ah, see, I just did all this work, right? You know, uh, so this can happen in a single day. It can happen throughout our life. This journey is so micro and macro. Um, and so this arrogant place is where I see a lot of people hanging out right now. A lot of influencers, a lot of coaches, a lot of like really new coaches too, might I say, new coaches, a lot of people who haven't created anything, but they're using a modality and they think that they're God. People who have had psychedelic experiences and think that they're God. Gurus now self-proclaiming their gurus and spiritual teachers and guides and all of this um, spiritual high horse, um, kind of like spiritual mm, almost manipulation, right? It's like uh, flagellation. It's like making myself bigger than I really am, right? Even Ram Dass would say it like, you know... I, he sits there, uh, their teachers just as much as he is He's like, I don't want to have this. If you want to play these dynamics where I'm teacher, or you're student. Okay, fine. That's for you. That's not what I'm calling it. Right. Because I know better. That's arrogance. Doesn't say that arrogance has a lot of people right now thinking that they have this identity, this role. And the, 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 the problem is not with having the identity or the role. The problem is with thinking that you need the identity or the role in order for you to feel like you're on this path, right? The the problem is having to like self-proclaim yourself as something other than just me. I am just me. I'm just Sarah, right? Um, and if you happen to learn something from me and call me teacher, great. And if you happen to um, not and think that I didn't love you properly and call me villain, 
great, right? All of the identities, all of the plugins, all of the names um, now become, need to become something that others put on you rather than you need to put on yourself, right? Like, I want to be called a leader because I'm a leader and I want to be called a teacher because I'm a teacher. And it's all of this, like this feeling of like, how do you know when you've reached a point of wisdom when you don't need any of those titles? Right? And so what's happening right now is a lot of people are hanging out at the peak, holding on to the peak, holding on to the peak in this arrogant position, thinking that they're better than, than they are, more equipped than they really are, and uh, and going really hard, going really hard at it until the next stage happens, which is the beginning of a new descent after the peak, hopefully, right? Again, not everybody experiences all of these stages. Some people will choose to hang out in arrogance. Now watch this. Choose to hang out in arrogance and um, and not go through the process of descent on the other side. You go through a descent on the side you just came from, meaning you go back into arrogance. I'm sorry, ignorance. You go back into ignorance. You kind of fall down the mountain a little bit, right? You fall past the stage of awakening and you fall back into ignorance. And now you're ignorant. Your arrogance has almost become ignorance again because you're ignorant now of the wound that you're carrying in this arrogant stage that says, I need to be depicted as this person who knows it all. I need to position myself above or, you know, above or more important or more knowledgeable or more whatever it is attached to the label. And that's, that is a level of ignorance. So you've just descended back down the mountain past the stage of awareness into a stage of ignorance once again, because now one of your shadows has become the actual arrogance that says to you, I know more than I do. I'm, I am God. I am the creator of my life. I'm all of these things that the new age spiritual community will tell you that you are, and you're not. When you realize that you're not any of those, you can, you can go on to the stage then of humility. And so we go up, up, up the mountain right? Let me just recap this for you super quick. We've gone up the mountain from purity up to injury, up to ignorance, up to awareness, which is like that snowy top right before you hit the peak. Awareness. And then the peak is arrogance. And now if we are lucky and um, uh, based enough to allow ourselves to go down the other side, which is humility. Something happens where there's a catalyst at that arrogant place, that place where we're like, I'm on top of the mountain. I know it all. I'm changing people's lives. I think I'm like this great guru person and this, that, and the other thing. And then something happens, right? This catalyst could be something outside of us, whereas like somebody gets hurt guidance or you know we get showed up by someone who knows something better and more than we do or this state of humility can come um, from life circumstances like we lose our money we become broke we lose our house we lose a relationship or right those, those are all outside things that, that could happen to humble us on this new descent now which is a beautiful place to be by the way right? This is the other stage that I was referring to earlier about how there's a couple stages of feeling really alive. This is one of them, right? Being humbled is being humbled is a hard place to be. It's painful. It's painful. It's like, wake up call. Whoa, I'm feeling again. I'm feeling these things that are very, um, familiar. They feel a little bit familiar, but they're just a, a little bit different, right? It's not injury in the form of like somebody hurt me. It's injury on the opposite side of the mountain that, that is the same level as awareness. So it kind of matches. A, oh my gosh, this is so good. Humility really matches the awareness in that it's an injury that has awareness with it. Oh my gosh. Humility is injury with awareness. It's not you hurt me. It's ow, that hurts because I see the bigger picture. It hurts because I know the truth, not it hurts because I don't know the truth, right? And so this humility happens. We begin to stumble down the, the next 
the other side of the mountain, the opposite side of the mountain now. And this is the part of the descent, right? Something happens to humble us. It could be something outside of us. It could also just be this state of the heart where we're like, whoa, wake up call. Sometimes God has a, has a grace on us and he just simply imparts a humility into our spirit where we're like, I don't know as much as I thought I did. In fact, the more I learn, the more I realize that I don't know as much as I thought I did. And um, we realize basically that the more we learn, the more we don't know. And this is another aspect, again, which I mentioned at the beginning, that may involve or maybe appropriate response to go into a seclusion or a recluse mode. We, we begin to speak less, right? Whereas like in that arrogant, we wanted to shout it on the mountaintop that we know all of these things. When we begin to descend on the other side, we go into humility. We almost want to shut down and speak less being like, because of the fact that I've just been humbled and I realized that I don't know as much as I think I know, I'm going to zip, zip my lips, right? We realize we might not be as important as we thought we were or wonderful, which, you know, I will tell you, you are wonderful. You are important. You're just not as wonderful or important as you think you are in the arrogant stage. <laughs> it's a very important distinction here. And so this humility stage can bring with it a sense of like, well, then I don't want to help anybody because I, I don't know anything. Um, in, and it can be a dangerous path too, because we then turn the humility almost into shame or guilt or um, low confidence. And we begin to take on this new identity of like, well, since I don't know as much as I thought I knew, I'm not going to do anything, right? I take, I take a route now of inaction and silence which can be okay for a time as long as you're, again, moving through and learning. But by staying here, we're communicating a new identity to ourselves, and that is lowering our confidence once more. So humility is a very, 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 very important place to be because it's the space where we, learn, we realized being in the arrogant place, first of all, it's kind of embarrassing. It's kind of embarrassing just to look back once you've been humbled and say, how could I have been so arrogant, right? It's a realization that you were arrogant. And if you're doing humility properly, you will not um, attach a feeling of shame to that realization that you've been arrogant. You could say, wow, I was super arrogant back then in acting like I knew it all and I'm super, you know, and I'm Jesus and all these things. So if we're doing humility right, we take with it um, an understanding that we don't need to be like, shame on you. How dare you? How embarrassing, right? You've just made an embarrassment of yourself. We we hopefully have brought some wisdom from the awakening and awareness stage into our humility, being like, okay, all right. I was pretty arrogant back then. I thought I knew it all. I thought I could change the world, right? I thought I could change the world, which is very audacious and an awesome place to be if it's not in a place of arrogance of saying like, oh, I know I can change the world and I'm the savior, okay? Very different, very different. So this humility stage is a point almost of another injury trauma uh, of being like, ow, ow. Um, didn't realize that, didn't realize how I was being. Now I do. Um, so I'm just going to like kind of shut down, right? I don't want to be seen. I don't want to be seen as that arrogant person. I realize how I looked before. I don't want to do that. And if we remain here, we remain traumatized. But if we allow ourselves to continue moving to the seventh stage, which is wisdom, I want to point out that the wisdom is not on the bottom of the mountain on the other side. It's actually slightly above the valley, right? You're not in the valley. So if we started at the valley in purity, we climb up to arrogance, to the peak of arrogance. We begin to descend with humility and we kind of stop at the side of the mountain, almost in the middle at wisdom, okay? Which means, this is what it means. It means we're a little bit higher off the ground than we started at purity, this is very important to remember because as I mentioned earlier with Maslow, 
if we begin now at this new higher point, we now set ourselves up and we're doing this right. We set ourselves up to have um, mm, higher plateaus. As I mentioned earlier, higher plateaus of existence, of human experience, of bliss, of enjoyment. And uh, we also close the gap a little bit on the distance between peaks, right? So if I don't go all the way down to the valley and I'm starting at the middle of the mountain and I'm climbing now the next mountain that presents itself right across from me, I don't have as high to climb to get to the next peak and fall again, right? So we continually go through that process as we're getting higher and higher with each descent, descend, descending period. So we descend now down into wisdom, which I would also like to say that we descend now back from the mind into the heart. So we are descending now into the heart, which is the best place to be. And this, this seat of the soul, right, provides and is the foundation and the fertile soil of, of all that we need to know. And in this wisdom place, this is where true wisdom happens after the humility trauma really has been healed, right? And Scott said this on the podcast earlier. He says, you know, sometimes we get traumatized and we we keep what we know inside now because we're um, we're traumatized by it. And it's like, I don't want to be seen. I don't want to say these things out loud. Um, I don't want to act like a know-it-all. And so um, almost in that place, then we keep our knowledge and our work inside of ourselves. And in some ways, this is kind of um, what the monk on the mountain would do. You know, so, oh, I've reached enlightenment. I know the secret to life. I know the secret to consciousness and existence and happiness and bliss. I'm just going to go enjoy this by myself. And there's really no enjoyment in that at all. There's um, almost like a disconnect, a, a numbness that comes with that. And so when we bring wisdom here, as we kind of merge and heal the trauma, trauma experience of humility, and, and, and it says, sure, I don't have it all figured out, and I never will. But here's what I do know. And, and we realize that we can be quiet yet still carry our voice and, and we can be, we can be um, meek, but still very powerful. We can move slow and have big impact. And we can realize that our own path is the power that we desire to share with the world. Um, and, and just simply what we've learned from that path is enough. And also we can acknowledge that we don't know what we don't know and not have to know all the answers. We also acknowledge that we are not the ones changing. We are not the ones transforming that we don't have to do it all, that we can, we can allow ourselves to, um, to allow other people to have the ownership of their journey. And we can allow ourselves to have the ownership of our journey and then just share what, share what we know. And also we bring this wisdom into perspective by saying, um, I know that this is what it was for me. Um, maybe this will help you. Maybe it will not, right? We speak less, but we don't seclude it. We don't shut down our voice. We speak less and we listen more um, from a much more quiet place but we don't say, um, you know, I'm not going to say that, or we, there's not a wounding that comes with that. Right. So we become unafraid now to bring this understanding that we've acquired from the inside out and how Scott put it, you know, was bringing the inner work out. And, um, and this is a place of true wisdom where we, we know these things and yet we can choose when to speak and when not to speak and when just our knowing is enough. You know, um, I had a, a phrase that I used to recite. It's almost like a mantra. This came to me in a meditation. The phrase was the knowing is enough. The knowing is enough. The knowing is enough. And true wisdom knows that the knowing can sometimes be enough, but we can also um, just earn when speaking our voice, speaking our experience, speaking our wisdom will be helpful in a situation. And we do that not from a place of needing to have our control over the situation and feel like we've impacted up 
impacted it. But we do that from a place of pure service and desire, meaning we do not become emptied in the process. Oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. True wisdom says, I discern when my knowing is enough. And I also discern when speaking what I do know is productive and will be helpful to someone, not because I need them to see me a certain way or say I'm a teacher or, do you know, um, identify me a certain way because it's the nature of my being to serve. And when I see an opportunity to serve, I serve because it's a desire, not because it's an obligation in order for them to see me a certain way. And this is the only way that we do not become emptied in the process of service, because we are doing this from a pure place. So you can see how these, this mountain um, travel journey, it's like they almost mirror each other, right? On the other side, then after purity, injury, ignorance, arrogance, humility comes wisdom, which is another place of purity. Not because nothing has happened to you, purity of your heart, purity of your intentions, purity of your mind. You've renewed yourself, right? This is like, I've renewed myself to the point that I can know what I know and serve where I feel called to serve because it's my desire to serve. And it would be a disservice for me to withhold my voice now. After all I've been through, it would be a disservice for me to withhold my truth that I've learned if I find that it would be helpful for someone in a certain circumstance. This is a very, very important part because it allows you to unhook yourself from the trauma that the humility has caused you in your arrogant place and say, I still know some things. I don't know all the things. And I'm realizing that now, but I do know a lot of things. I've been through a lot of things. And here's what I've learned through those and when the opportunity arises, I would love to share that with somebody who I think would benefit greatly from it. And if the opportunity arises that it's better for me to keep my mouth shut, I can do that too, knowing that inside the knowing is enough. This is the journey. Now, I also said that I would point out where we are, where I, I see us to be collectively in this journey. And um, I think I said that a little bit. We're kind of in this state of arrogance um, collectively as a society, you know, and um, we're getting some injury here from um, bigger powers that are above us. But we're a lot of us in this arrogance, um, thinking that we're way more better, um, profound, important, powerful, um, magical than we really are. And now we have arrogant people leading ignorant people. Oh my gosh. Now we're at a point where we have arrogant people leading ignorant people. And, um, you know, a lot of people are really, really trying to be in this awakening awareness. And um, this is where we have to be careful. We have to, we have to be very careful. And this is where, when we get into that humility stage, we take a look at ourselves and we say, whoa, if I have been doing harm to anybody because of my arrogant place of being, then I don't want to help anyone. And we recluse, we pull back. I also want to mention that wisdom is not necessarily the destination, at least not for everyone, right? Some people, it's like, it's a great place to aspire to be. Again, the pursuit of wisdom is the whole purpose that brings life to life. It's this pursuit of, um, it's the, it's honestly, it's the awakening and the wisdom, the pursuit of both of those that brings, um, 
a, a sense of aliveness to life, right? In the absence of that, we have a very mundane, um, seemingly purposeless, um, very, very um, bleak look of life, okay? Um, but it's also important to note that the peaks are also aren't our goal, right? These time at the peaks are very short-lived, hopefully, especially if it's arrogance. Um, but what I'm referring to is the peak of the exciting moments of life. The, the peak moments are short-lived. And um, really true wisdom comes when we are not seeking those peak moments. And instead, we're, again, like I said, raising the height of our plateaus so that we experience less severe valleys, meaning, again, back to what I said at the very beginning of this episode, meaning we are more focused on the how that we are experiencing all of this than the what or the where, or even the, um, not even the what or the where, but how other people see where we are, right? If I feel like uh, people need to see me as that monk on the mountain, then I I am very far from any type of wisdom um, or enlightenment. And so now bridging this now is saying that we understand these different stages is to now say, how can I enjoy in some way each one of these stages, right? And maybe enjoy is too far of a stretch because we are human, right? Maybe it's like, how can I suffer less? Okay. Instead of enjoying it, maybe that's too far for you to think about. If you're being injured, how do I enjoy it? It's like, how do you enjoy being hit, right? It's how do I suffer less? How do I suffer less in this stage of the process um, and really gain what I need to here so I cannot get myself out of it as quickly as possible, but really do this stage fully justice, experience it fully, and then keep on moving through, right? We don't want to stop. We don't want to stop and be like, okay, really feel this, really feel it. You know how people say, like, really just feel it, take some time and just feel it. It's like, just be in it just be in it. And if feelings come up, then feel them. Feelings come up, feel them, and then keep moving through. And if you didn't learn from the feeling, if you didn't, if you didn't have it in you to be like, okay, what is this feeling trying to communicate with me? What is this? Or just being okay with feeling what the feeling is, then you stay there. You stay there and you're going to feel the feeling again. It's quite simple. So you don't have to try to do anything here. You don't have to try to move. You don't have to try to feel. You don't have to try to take your time. You just have to be. You just have to be in it. You just have to let go of all of the need to define the process and just be in it. And this is embodiment. This is embodiment. This is embodying the spiritual process in a way that merges the human experience, which allows you to feel but it removes the fact that you feel like you need to suffer in it. Like I can feel pain and not have to suffer, right? I can feel the pain and not have to suffer that so that someone else sees that I'm suffering and comes to my aid, being my rescuer, okay? I can feel it so that I don't have to suffer, but, but I don't have to suffer in order to get me to move in a certain direction. I don't need to experience suffering in order to get me to move from here to there. I don't need to suffer in order to get me to be motivated to like work out or work hard on my business or take it to the next level. So it's the removing of this, the need to be suffering in order to move in any direction, right? So we can say, I can feel this, that's the human part. I can feel this feeling, this pain, this emotion, this whatever it is. I do not need to suffer. And by choosing not to suffer, we can more fluidly move into the next whatever stage that we find ourselves to be going. Okay. And the quicker we can come back to this place of wisdom, this purity and awareness is where this is where, oh my gosh, wisdom is where purity meets awareness. Purity and awareness together, they become married. And the more frequently we can come come to this place of the mountain, 
We begin to begin moving in the world differently. We are moving now in embodiment. We're embodying it. We are now bridging the gap between human and divine. We are bringing it to this descended place into the heart. Okay. We do not need to ascend up anywhere. In fact, we do not need to transcend this experience or transcend this plane of existence, meaning the 3D. We do not need to blast off. We do not need to astral travel. We do not need to go anywhere but right here and bring in the beautiful wisdom in the seat of the soul that is right here in your heart. So really, all of this is, is learning how to live from the heart. It's all about the heart. And so this is important now because I'm sure you will say, you will have said by now, oh, I'm there. I'm at that place, right? And so now you'll know the path, at least if you want it to be. And um, and remember that your focus here is not to get to a certain place. You're not be like, I need the wisdom. I need the wisdom so I can bring all of this out into the world. It's like, again, you're 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 in the ego. We focus on the how. We focus on how can I live this experience, go through all these stages and cycle through and and uh, remove suffering and just be with what is. Be with what is and be okay with it. And not have to say that we're, um, oh my gosh, I've backtracked, right? People think if you've gotten to wisdom and then you find yourself again in like in a new awakening, you're like, oh my gosh, or, or ignorance. Oh, I've backtracked. I've gone back. I've backslided. It's like, no, you haven't. You're constantly on the path. You're always on the path. You're always on the path. You're always progressing through. Not forward, not backward. You're always progressing through. And this is so important to remember because it's a spectrum. Remember? It's not linear across or up and down. You're not going to climb the ladder and then just arrive somewhere in heaven. Okay. You're here to have a human experience. You're also here to have wisdom. This is enlightenment. Enlightenment is accepting and knowing that the human experience is what you're here to master. And then step two is realizing that that you are not on a pursuit to master the human experience. You are on a pursuit to experience the human experience and find a way to not suffer in it. This is also part of surrender. It's part of surrendering and saying, oh, what is, is, and I'm okay with that. And what I know is enough. Now, there's there are so many other segue parts to this, but ultimately, I hope what you take from this is impactful and powerful for you to go forward and change the way that you move through the world and find a way to bring the extraordinary, to find the extraordinary in the mundane. Find a way to fall in love with your human experience. And wherever you find yourself in these seven stages, just know that you are exactly where you're supposed to be. Find out what is there for you. Feel whatever that is required to feel. And set yourself free of the suffering so you can move through. Just keep surrendering it. Keep surrendering it. Keep surrendering it. Keep surrendering all of it. All the path, all the purpose, all of the need to know. Let go of your need to control the path, allow it to be, and you will arrive exactly where you're supposed to arrive, which is in a higher state of enjoyment, a higher state of experiencing this life. I love you all. Please let me know how you loved this episode. This was a, one of my favorites so far. Um, 
which is because I recently came out of the humility stage and, you know, um, and realizing what all of this, what all of this is and being okay to bring my voice back out. Um, and, and realizing that I don't have to say it from a place of me knowing it all. I had to say it from a place of this is what I know here. How does this resonate with you? You pick, you choose, listen to your heart, find out what resonates for you, take what does and let the rest go. I love you all. Please rate this show. Please share it with somebody. Please share it on social media. If you do, please tag me. I will repost it on my channel. I deeply, deeply love you guys. And I'm a deep gratitude for you. Y'all make my world go around. Kind of. Love you. And until next time, I'll talk to you very soon. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Ignite the Spark Within. If this podcast brought you value or you think it would bring someone else value, please hit that share button. My mission is to reach and help as many people as I possibly can. And you just never know who could use that one good piece of information. And hey, if you have any topics, discussion questions, or ideas for future episodes, you can reach me directly at sarah at sparkflc.com and just write podcast in the subject line. And if you haven't already, please rate the podcast on your favorite podcast channel. This helps bring awareness to the show. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications so you're alerted for all future episodes. Please go ahead and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. And if you're interested in pursuing coaching for yourself, you can visit sparkflc.com for more information.